Hello, fifth grade, and welcome to history. This week, we are studying something that is very fun. Uh, it is the lost presidents of America. Now, I know you've been told that there are 45 presidents of America, and that is true. However, there were 14 presidents who actually served the country before George Washington. I had someone last year who told this to their parent, and their parent went, that's not true, and they looked it up and they found out it was. So I will explain, because I, I have to be careful with the phrasing on this. I am not saying of the United States of America, I am saying president of America, and there is a difference, because George Washington was the first president of the United States of America. However, there were 14 presidents before George Washington that served the colonies of America, America, during the war between, uh, between England and the colonies, because someone had to be running the country. So let's take a look at this, shall we? Um, okay, so as you know, US has had 45 presidents. You could technically say 46 if you wanted to say the president of the Confederacy, but we're not gonna get into the Civil War at this point. Okay, so 45 presidents, officially. However, from 1776 to 1789, which was the years of the American War for Independence, someone had to be in charge. And this is where the 14 lost presidents come in. They ran the country with the first government, which was the Continental Congress. They were basically the president of the Continental Congress running all of the colonies during the war. So let's talk about some of these people. Uh, first off, there is Peyton Randolph. He was from Virginia. He was the first one elected. Now, initially with these presidents, they did not have a set number of like years that they would serve. In America, we have set numbers of years for how long people can serve in different things. President can serve for a total of eight years, but his term is for four. Um, so for example, uh, I'm trying to think of, well, okay, we can use uh, modern and current times. So President Trump has been president for almost four years now. If he is reelected, he will serve for a total of eight years, aka two terms of four years. Before a certain year in America, though, there wasn't actually a set term limit. So there were a couple presidents who served for more than two terms and in fact served for three terms. Um... So they served for a total of 12 years, not just eight. Then they put in a limit that you can only serve for a total of eight years um, or two terms. Those terms can be together back to back, like with Obama. Obama served two terms in a row um, from 2008 until 2014. He, he's, or sorry, 2008 to 2016. My brain. Uh, eight years, Mrs. Straka. Eight. Um, so he served a total of two terms in a row. There have also been presidents where they served one term of four years, someone else was elected the next uh, the next time election season rolled around, and then after that person had served their four years, the president before them came back and was re-elected again and served two years, but there was someone else in between the two years. How, how would you do that? Yeah, like this was one of their terms and this was one of their terms and someone else was right here. Um, so that's happened before as well. This, the idea of set terms was something to keep it from becoming basically a monarchy because if someone kept getting reelected over and over and over and over again, they could serve however long they want, which technically you can do if you get into the Senate. Just, there you go. I... I don't want to say for certain how long Senate terms are because I think I'll get it wrong and then someone will comment, oh, Mrs. Straka, it's not this. And I'll go, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so anyways, there's not a limit actually on how many times someone can serve in the Senate. They can get reelected as many times as they want as long as, you know, their constituents keep electing them. Constituents, by the way, are the people that elect them. So for example, we all live in Washington. Our current governor is Jay Inslee. Um, so Governor Jay Inslee was elected by his constituents. Constituents are the people who live in the area that he is in charge of. So basically for him, his constituents are the citizens of Washington state, not Oregon, not Idaho, Washington, because Oregon and Idaho people cannot elect him. It is the Washington people who elect him. Uh, much in the same way in, uh, Spokane itself, we have our current mayor who we elected, the constituents, or at least, you know, some of us did, um, Nadine Woodward. Nadine Woodward was elected by her constituents and is now uh, the mayor of Spokane. So anyways, that's terminology for you. By the way, you should know who's in charge of different things because 
The way that people get away with bad stuff is when people don't even know what's happening. So if you don't know who your governor is, if you don't know who your mayor is, who your president is, or who your vice president is, or your secretary of state, bad things can happen if you don't actually know who's in charge and you just expect them to figure it out and do good stuff. You're expecting people to do good, but they might not be doing good. So it's a very important thing, once you all are old enough to actually vote, to know who's in charge. So if it's a bad person, you can kind of, let's, let's not bring them back because it will make bad things happen. So just a thing to know, you should know that. If you didn't know it, Washington's governor, Jay Inslee, Spokane's mayor, Nadine Woodward, um, current president, Donald Trump, uh, Vice President Mike Pence. You should know those four names. Those are kind of important. Um, now, I'm not saying any of them are bad or need to go, and I'm not saying any of them are perfect and they should stay. I'm not going to say anything along those lines. I'm just saying you should know who's in charge. That's kind of important. Um, and extra bonus on the cake if you know what they actually believe in. Because if they believe in terrible things, we maybe shouldn't elect them. If they believe in good things, we maybe should elect them because they might be able to help out a lot. Anyways, back to the actual thingy. I always get into this. I have to be very careful <laughs> what I say in terms of politics. Okay, let's move back into safe territory, shall we? Great. Okay, Peyton Randolph was first. He was from Virginia. How fantastic. Second was Henry Middleton. He actually ended up only serving for four days. He had to leave after four days. That's fun. Uh, bonus points to you if you look up Henry Middleton and find out why he only served for four days. That's a bonus point to you. Have your parent text me if you figure that out. Okay, number three uh, was John Hancock. You know, the fancy signature guy. In my own personal copy of the notes that I wrote out, I did his signature. Oh, there it is. Ta-da! John Hancock's signature uh, that I did on the bottom of my notes. So there you go, fun thing. Um, he served for three years. Uh, notice a lot of these, like like I was saying before and then I got distracted, with the term limit thing, initially there was no term limit, there was no set time of this is how long you serve uh, as president of the colonies, and there was also no set time of like this is, this is when you have to leave or this is how many terms you're allowed to serve. So some of these will be like four days in the case of Henry Middleton, and some of them will be like three years in the case of Hancock. It kind of just varies. Uh, number four, Henry Lawrence from South Carolina. Uh, his son, John Lawrence, actually served with Washington in the war, and he was one of the biggest advocates for um, getting rid of slavery. So there you go, fun factoid about his family. Uh, number five, John Jay. He sounds like a bird. Um, John Jay, he actually became the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. The chief justice is like the main justice on the Supreme Court. Uh, I won't get into the Supreme Court. We, we won't go near that. There's a lot of ways I could go with this, guys. I'm, I'm holding back. You could talk about like how many justices are on the Supreme Court, the first female justice on the Supreme Court, who I have met, actually. Ooh. I'll make that another bonus point. If you find who the first female uh, justice on the Supreme Court was, I'll give you a bonus point. I met her and I got to go hear her speak at an event, and she was awesome. It was super cool. She was a very sweet lady. Um... Kudos to her. So yeah, bonus point if you find out what her name was and you have your parent text me what uh, what the name of the first female justice on the Supreme Court. Bonus point. So many bonus points this video. Wow. I just get excited because it's America stuff. Hold on. I should have some coffee and calm down. Okay, let's move on. All right. Um, number six, Samuel Huntington. He served for two years. We're just going to go all over the place with the timeline here. Um, seven, Thomas McKean. He was actually a lawyer. The fascinating thing about a lot of the people who served uh, as the first 14 presidents of America, I didn't say United States, I said America. Uh, the first 14 presidents of America was a lot of them were actually lawyers or ultimately became judges uh, or were writers uh, of important materials. So it's very interesting that a lot of these people legally knew the law extremely well, which is also why they knew England couldn't be doing what it was doing. And so that's partially why it was so good to elect them because they knew this is why we're standing against this and this is why it's important to stand against this. So that's good stuff. All right, um, moving on. Uh, number eight, John Hansen. He was the first person after they did established set terms. If it didn't totally make sense in the notes, what I mean is, 
For the first seven, there was not a set time period of A, how long you had to serve, or B, like a max amount that you could serve. And so when we hit, uh, when we hit number eight, John Hansen, they voted and decided, okay, we need to, we need to have something a little bit more set in place here because we don't want someone who's not that good, who just stays in and isn't helping anything. We also don't want someone who is really good getting kicked out after like six months. So let's make a set term and we'll just keep, you know, reelecting or voting or whatever on it so that, you know, the power keeps shifting and it's not stuck with one person for too long because we do not want a monarchy. And so uh, for John Hansen, he was the first one elected after they decided we'll have one year terms. So you'll, you'll be elected, you're in charge for one year and then someone else gets in charge. Um, so John Hansen, one year, uh, first one after that happened. The next person, number nine, the most fantastic name in the history of ever, Elias Boudinot. Yes. Uh, he is French. Ta-da. Um, Elias Boudinot, well, his name is French at least. Um, Elias Boudinot was actually from New Jersey, which is fun. And oh my goodness, his name, Boudinot. Eli like, oh, just fantastic. Elias Boudinot. I mean, that's... That's got to show up somewhere because that's such a good name. Okay, number 10, Thomas Mifflin. Uh, he actually served as a general in the Continental Army. And because of that, he only served for seven months. So he didn't actually do the full year term. He just did seven months. Now, what happened was because he only did the seven months, they would bring in someone for the last number of months, those last five months in his case, and then they could be reelected for another year um, because they'd be, you know, taking over. So the person after him was Richard Henry Lee, number 11. Now, Richard Henry Lee has probably the most written on him. I tried not to make any of them too long just because there's so much information I could put into this. I have to limit it back a lot in terms of making sure I'm not doing a massive amount of just information dump on you. So Richard Henry Lee is wonderful. For one thing, he was the first to make a motion for independence um, in the Continental Congress. And he was also the first to suggest a declaration of independence, um, from England and Great Britain. So he is one of the most important characters in terms of America ultimately becoming a free and separate, uh, country from England. And yet he is not remembered almost at all, which is a horrible shame because everybody remembers you know, it, it, the thing is, sorry, I'm stuttering and blah, blah, blah. the thing is there were so many remarkable people at the beginning of America's founding. So many just absolute geniuses. And it's the craziest thing that we just had this perfect storm of brilliant men and women who came in and managed to take this this ragtag set of colonies and fight the biggest world superpower of the time and win was partially because we had just this wonderful set of genius people who were helping to create this. People who the names are known and also the people who, because there were so many, they just aren't as well known. So like Richard Henry Lee, nobody really knows about him, but then you also have Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin. You have all of these people that were just super geniuses. Cyrus Griffin, we're going to get to him. He's amazing. Um, and Peyton Randolph, Henry Middles. It, it's, there are so many people, John Hancock, uh, who are absolute geniuses that it's difficult to actually remember them all because all of these people were remarkable. There's not a single one of them who was not absolutely astounding. And that's only the politicians. We're not even getting into the pastors of the time, like Whitfield. Um, we're not even getting into the great, the great awakening where you had some of the most amazing pastors and amazing sermons, sinners in the hands of an angry God by Jonathan Edwards. These men were giants intellectually, absolutely brilliant. And there's just so many of them that they get forgotten despite doing incredible things and helping set our country on the road that it has taken. I'm sorry, I get very passionate about this. They're crazy cool. Um, so cool. And I'm going to recommend a book uh, if you want to read it. It might be a, like a tad above your level, maybe not too much. Your parents would probably enjoy it though. So parents, if you're watching, book that I'm going to point out in a minute. Um, okay, sorry. Where was I? Richard Henry Lee. <gasps> okay. 
Moving on, number 12, Nathaniel Gorham. Nathaniel Gorham only served for six months. And so someone else actually came in and took over his term. And that person was Arthur St. Clair, who was from Scotland. Uh, so not everyone who came over was originally from Britain. There were a few people from Scotland because Scotland had been a bit oppressed by England for a decent while, if you remember Jenny Geddes. <laughs> A good hint there. Jenny Geddes is only like a hundred years before this happens. Um, uh, so 1627, you know, was Jenny Geddes. So Arthur St. Clair actually had come over from Scotland. Uh, he finished off Nathaniel Gorham's term and served the last six months of it. And then finally, number 14, Cyrus Griffin was the last before Washington, and he later became a federal judge. Um, Sorry, I'm trying not to go too into detail on these. All right, uh, with that, I also finished the notes with 38 people signed the Constitution, 56 signed the Declaration. Um, so on this, what I, uh, I have it on my notes. I didn't put it on yours. You can mark it if you would like. On mine, I did a plus sign for the people who signed the Constitution, and I did a, a little diamond sign, or uh, yeah, I did a diamond for the people who signed the declaration. So of those people who signed the declaration, number three, John Hancock was declaration. We know this because he, uh, he he's one of the easiest to remember because he signed it so big, he wanted King George to be able to read it without his spectacles. Fantastic. Um, very cheeky. I mean, how spirited is that? Uh, number six, Samuel Huntington signed the declaration. Uh, number seven, Thomas McKean declaration. Uh, number 10, Thomas Mifflin signed the constitution. Uh, number 11, Richard Henry Lee signed the declaration, of course, because it was his idea in the first place. Uh, and number 12, Nathaniel Gorham signed the constitution. So there you go. That's the people. And the reason the other ones didn't is because they were, you know, floating in and out and weren't necessarily in the Continental Congress when the Declaration was put forward, or they weren't in the Continental Congress when the Constitution was put forward. So it's not because they just refused adamantly to sign this document. It was probably because they weren't actually in, um, in the Continental Congress at the time. Okay, um, stars for this one. I would know there were 14 lost presidents. Like 14, probably an important number there. Um, I would probably know who was the first uh, lost president of the United States, wink, wink, smiley face. Uh, and I would maybe know how many people signed the constitution and how many signatures there are on the declaration of independence. Just, just maybe would be helpful to know. Uh, the book that I mentioned, uh, book that I mentioned, uh, that is fantastic. An experiment in liberty. Oh, that's really hard to see that. An experiment in liberty by George Washington, or er, by George Washington. He wrote this for us. No, uh, this is by George Grant. He was one of my old teachers and mentors. He's absolutely a genius writer. He's actually written speeches for presidents. Go figure. Um, and he basically goes through everything that led up to the war between the states. Uh, and he also covers the the state of the church in America as the war was about to start, which was a major factor in it actually beginning. So he covers the Great Awakening, he covers Whitfield, um, and he also goes into all of these lost presidents. Um, what chapter is it that he goes into? <laughs> One of the headers is called Thundering Pulpits. <sighs> yes. Um, it's, it's just absolutely genius. Uh, he writes in a very understandable style that's fantastic. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend it if you want to really get a very accurate portrayal of what America was like at this time. And at the same time, oh yeah, like he talks about Nathan Hale, famously quoted for, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. Again, just so many genius people. Um, so he, he covers all of this. He has the, it's one of the last chapters is when he goes into the lost presidents. I believe it's uh, chapter 13, wartime governance. He goes into a lot of these and, um, yeah, yeah. The forgotten presidents. So he has this, uh, whole section on it, starting with, uh, Peyton Randolph, Henry Middleton, John Hancock, Henry Lawrence. So he goes through all of these and, uh, helps to actually, uh, dive deeper into each of these in just little snapshots that really give you an excellent um, portrayal of their character. So I, I highly recommend that. 
Um, I will make another video where I actually read through those deeper delvings into the Lost Presidents. So there's going to be multiple videos for history this week. This is one. Uh, that will be another that's optional if uh, students, if you want to know a bit more about some of these men because they're fantastic. It won't be very long because they're pretty quick. Uh, and then also, I'm going to sing for you the Lost President song that I wrote to help you get them straight in your mind. And I'll also put that in a separate video so it's easier to find so you don't have to fast forward to like the 20 minute mark of this one. Okay, so the Lost President song. Uh, this is one that I wrote last year for the students to help them learn the Lost Presidents. I will sing it for you now. The words will be in your packet as well as on Jupiter uh, under history next to the notes. Uh, and then also I'll have a separate video of me singing it. But here we go, the Lost President song. There have been 45 presidents since the founding of our land, but there are 14 more presidents who have been forgotten. These men led our country through the war with George and Great Britain, and we haven't fit learned all their names. Watch as we recite them. Peyton Randolph from Virginia was the first to take the lead. Henry Middleton, who served for just four days in 74. John Hancock with his signature that's big enough to read. Henry Lawrence, whose son served with Washington in the war. John Jay was fifth, then Samuel Huntington. Thomas McKean and John Henson. Elias Boudinno from Jersey. Thomas Mifflin, seven months. Then Richard Henry Lee, first to call for independence. Nathaniel Gorham, but only for six months. Arthur St. Clair, who was from Scotland, then Cyrus Griffin is the last before George Washington. These 14 men were our presidents, no longer forgotten. Hey! So, there you go. That's the thing. That's the, wow, the thing. <laughs> That's the song. Um, I apologize. I haven't sung it all today, so that was probably really iffy. Uh, I will have a separate video where I sing through that. I'll see if I can figure out how to do, like, the bouncing ball with the words at the bottom, but that might not happen. So I'm not very technologically advanced in terms of YouTube video extra thingies. So just live with me. Okay, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. That's my super, super quick go through of the Lost Presidents of America before George Washington. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful day and I miss you all very much.